Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, my friend. Good evening, Alex. And uh, we're going to be picking up the, the border discussion with uh, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, who was the key negotiator for the Democrats on that bipartisan bill that uh, Donald Trump managed to veto, even though he technically doesn't have veto power. He somehow reached in there and told the Republicans, you absolutely must not do it. Little taste of Republican politics in the year 2024. That. Yeah, and, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is also going to be joining us uh, talking about the Supreme Court. Now, he might be outraged that the Supreme Court is taking the Trump appeal. I am not. I tried to make that clear last night. Not outraged a bit. Saving my outrage for the opinion, if it is an outrageous opinion. But I do find it outrageous that Clarence Thomas has not recused yes. himself from the case. And so we'll see what uh, Senator Whitehouse has to say about that. You could do a whole show on Clarence Thomas's ethical um, conflicts, and I would watch all of could, it, Lawrence. We could do it. Thanks, so Alex. Oh, I will watch tonight. Right. Have a good show. Thank you. Well, today, Defendant Donald Trump said he now cannot afford to pay E. Jean Carroll $83 million in the judgment against him that she won. Donald Trump asked a court to proceed with an appeal of that judgment, allow him to appeal the judgment without Donald Trump posting a bond that guarantees to the court that he will pay that judgment if and when he loses that appeal. E. Jean Carroll's attorneys opposed that request today, telling the court, quote, he simply asks the court to trust me and offers in a case with an $83.3 million judgment against him, the court filing equivalent of a paper napkin signed by the least trustworthy of borrowers. And criminal defendant Donald Trump filed a surprise motion and Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's Florida prosecution of Donald Trump for violations of the Espionage Act and illegal possession of classified documents after Jack Smith filed a proposed trial date in the case of July 8th. Donald Trump's lawyers did not ask for a date after the presidential election. They didn't ask for a date next year. They asked for a trial date just four weeks later on August 12th, only four weeks after the trial date requested by Jack Smith. Donald Trump's favorite judge, Aileen Mercedes Cannon, who he appointed to her federal judgeship, will decide that trial date. And Republicans were very disappointed today in Hunter Biden's closed-door testimony under oath to a Republican-controlled House committee, because apparently his testimony was solid and clear about his father not being involved in his business and because of gems in the trans transcript that was released tonight like this. Mr. Gates, were you on drugs when you were on the Burisma board? The witness, Mr. Gates, look me in the eye. You really think that's appropriate to ask me? Mr. Gates, absolutely, the witness. Of all the people sitting around this table, do you think that's appropriate to ask me? Carson Gates, of course, of all the people sitting around the table, is the only one who was investigated by the FBI for possible trafficking of underage girls, including the use of illegal drugs with them. Donald Trump desperately tried to compete with President Biden's visit to the southern border today by going to another spot on the border, 350 miles away from the president, where once again, Donald Trump spoke gibberish about the border. Millions of people from places unknown, from countries unknown, who don't speak languages. We have languages coming into our country. We have nobody that even speaks those languages. No. We have people in this country who speak every language. And then Donald Trump added this lie about the people who are crossing the southern border. These are the people that are coming into our country, and they're coming from jails, and they're coming from prisons, and they're coming from mental institutions, and they're coming from insane asylums, and they're terrorists. They're being led into our, our country. And uh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Needless to say, that is not an accurate description of the people crossing the border. He's lying about the people who cross the border and who they are. But at the same time, Donald Trump is doing everything he can to help everyone who is illegally crossing the border now to continue illegally crossing the border. 
because Donald Trump ordered Republicans in the Senate and the House to not even allow a vote on a bipartisan border security bill negotiated by our first guest tonight, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, and Republican conservative senator from Oklahoma, James Langford. Donald Trump publicly took credit for killing that bill. They're blaming it on me. I said, that's okay. Please blame it on me. Please. And so Donald Trump is saying that as long as Joe Biden is president, which is at least until January 20th of next year, Donald Trump wants everyone who is currently crossing the southern border to continue to cross the southern border. That means in Donald Trump's own description of the people crossing the southern border, that means he wants terrorists to cross the southern border. He wants drug dealers to cross the southern border. He wants massive shipments of fentanyl to cross the southern border. He wants murderers to cross the southern border. He wants all of those people and things that he describes to cross the southern border that he says he is opposed to crossing the southern border at the same time, says he's opposed to that. Now, those are the mental challenges that are presented to Trump voters every day, which they fail to comprehend. Donald Trump says people are going to die because the southern border isn't secure, and he wants them to continue to die every single day that he is not president. And Trump voters say, sounds great. So Trump politicians do exactly the same thing. Trump politicians who take orders from Donald Trump. President Biden described the, to the Border Patrol officers he met with today what that bill would do. With this deal, we could hire 1,500 additional border security agents, 1,500 additional officers and officers, and between ports of entry. For the last four years, staffing has been roughly that, flat, just flat. Agents working overtime, spending long hours patrolling the border, making major sacrifices. And I know it takes a big toll on them and their families. That's why in December I signed a bill finally getting Border Patrol agents, what I've been pushed by and reminded by the congressman, overtime pay they deserve. Finally getting overtime pay. I, I mean, it's ridiculous it took this long. It was a long past time, and I was proud to do it. But we need to do more. It's time to step up. It's time to step up, provide them with significantly more personnel and capability. And what you just heard is why the Border Patrol agents who in the past have supported Donald Trump are now supporting the bill Joe Biden wants to sign into law and that Donald Trump wants to prevent from becoming law. The majority of Democrats and Republicans in both houses support this legislation until someone came along and said, don't do that, it'll benefit the incumbent. That's a hell of a way to do business in America for such a serious problem. We need to act. And then Joe Biden made Donald Trump an offer he couldn't refuse. Unless, of course, Donald Trump doesn't really care about the border. I understand my predecessor's legal past today. So here's what I would say to Mr. Trump. Instead of playing politics with this issue, instead of telling members of Congress to block this legislation, join me, or I'll join you in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together. You know and I know it's the toughest, most efficient, most effective border security bill this country has ever seen. So instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? Let's remember who the heck we work for. We work for the American people, not the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. We work for the American people. And here's what Republican Senator James Langford said about the border security bill that he personally negotiated before Donald Trump ordered him to abandon his own bill. I would also remind folks during the Trump administration, we also had days of more than 4,000 people that were illegally crossing the border under the Trump administration in 2019, and they were struggling because there's gaps and loopholes in the law. Are we as Republicans going to have press conferences and complain the border's bad and then intentionally leave it open? After the worst month in American history in December, now we've got to actually determine, are we going to just complain about things or are we going to actually address and change as many things as we can? Senator Langford's partner in the negotiations for that bill, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, said today, the border is a money-making grievance machine for Republicans. That's all.
period. Stop. Keeping it a problem raises them money, drives ratings, helps them win elections. They don't want to fix it. That's why they killed the bipartisan border bill. Leading of our, our discussion tonight is Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. He's a, me a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and Foreign Relations Committee. Senator, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And, and I know how difficult it must be for you uh, working on nego uh, negotiations on legislation like that that is so complex and takes so long. And to see it all abandoned just because Donald Trump gave the order. Yeah, it's difficult for the American people because, um, you know, the vast middle of this country in between the 20 yard lines believes that we should have legal immigration to this country. But they also believe that we should have a secure border. And they know we don't right now when you have 10,000 people crossing on a daily basis. Um, I give a lot of credit to my colleague, Senator Lankford. He actually didn't bow to Donald Trump's pressure. He was one of only four Republicans in the United States Senate that voted for the bill. Um, but the reality is, as you said in your opening, that Republicans are allergic to solving the problem at the border. They've become so used to seeing the border as a political problem to exploit that they can't imagine a world in which it's solved. I mean, what would they go on TV and talk about? How would they raise money from their base? What would they do on the weekends if they can't go down to the border, pretend to be border agents patrolling for undocumented crossers? Um, we had a bipartisan bill that would have given the president extraordinary new powers to shut down the border when crossings were too high to process asylum claims in a matter of months, not years, um, to put real personnel uh, and technology on the border to interrupt the flow of fentanyl. And ultimately, Donald Trump told Republicans, yeah, I don't really care that it's good for the country. All I care is that if the border was more under control, it would hurt me politically. And that's the situation that we're in today. So listen, I get paid to put up with this BS. Um, the American people, they're the ones that should be pretty pissed off. Uh, I want to listen to more about what the president uh, described to, to the agents about what's in this bill, especially uh, on what it could do on the illegal importation of fentanyl. Let's listen to this. We also need more cutting edge inspection machines to detect and stop fentanyl from entering the United States of America. A year ago, I stood at the border in El Paso and I watched these machines at work. They were able to detect everything from fentanyl to weapons to people being smuggled in cargo containers. This, this compromise bill would provide an additional four, three, $424 million for 100 more of these machines and could save lives in the process. This compromise legislation will also give me as president or any of the next president emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border between ports of entry when the numbers of immigrants and migrants, excuse me, overwhelm the border, starting straining the Border Patrol's ability to process them. Senator, a hundred more of these machines that can detect fentanyl, uh, if you don't want that to become law, we we just can't continue to listen to you pretending to be concerned about people who are suffering from addiction to fentanyl, which has been uh, a Republican chant for all four years, all every year of the Biden presidency. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, Republicans go out there and claim that they care about this fentanyl epidemic. And listen, every single one of us now knows someone who has died of a fentanyl overdose. This is an absolute epidemic. But Republicans are willing to do nothing, not a single thing to solve this problem. They're trying to destroy our health care system, rip apart the Medicaid system that provides care for these individuals to try to get them through recovery. And now we know that they're not willing to do anything at the border. The fact of the matter is most of the fentanyl coming into this country comes through the ports of entry, right? These are the places where, where vehicle travel brings fentanyl through the ports. Right now, we don't have enough machines to do x-rays of all of those vehicles, trucks and passenger vehicles. This bill would have provided the funding to dramatically increase the number of trucks and cars that we screen. We would have, we would have tied a noose around the traffickers' business model, but now they will be able to continue to move product into this country because there's no executive order that can invent the money to buy these machines. Only the bipartisan bill could have done that. So uh, Donald Trump just spent the last hour on on uh, Fox uh, talking to Sean Hannity at 
a very peaceful looking section of the border where there was absolutely no uh, trouble going on in the background there at all. And Donald Trump couldn't even fill the whole hour with his thoughts about the border. He diverted for about 12 of uh, one fourth of the show to talk about abortion and in vitro fertilization and stress that he's completely in favor uh, of IVF and he's going to figure out some magic formula that the whole country is going to agree on on abortion, uh, pretending that he was not the driving force in overturning Roe versus Wade. Yeah, well, the only reason that IVF is under threat today, the only reason that states are banning abortion, the only reason that women's lives are in jeopardy all across this country is because Donald Trump made it his number one priority to put judges on the bench who would allow states to be able to ban abortion, to control women's bodies. This was the top priority for Donald Trump. He said as such. Uh, and now Republicans are coming to grips with the fact that the huge, overwhelming majority of the country does not want judges and male politicians in charge of women's bodies. They certainly do not want IVF uh, to be banned. But that is what Donald Trump set in motion. He was not apologetic about it. He didn't hide it. And it is just too late to walk it back. And let's be absolutely clear. If Donald Trump becomes president again, he will do exactly what he did in his first term. He will appoint to the bench judges that will allow politicians to ban abortion, to ban contraception, and to ban IVF. That is just the 100 percent truth. He can't run from it. And I don't think people are going to buy it as he and other Republicans try to walk it back. Senator Chris Murphy, thank you very much for joining us tonight on this uh, day when the bill you negotiated was in the center of our news. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, lifelong border resident Beto O'Rourke will join us next. Folks, the bipartisan border security deal is a win for the American people. And it's a win for the people of Texas. And it's fair for those who legitimately have a right to come here to begin with. It's a win for the people of Brownsville. And I believe that's why the Border Patrol Union endorsed it. I believe that's why the National Chamber of Commerce, the National Chamber of Commerce endorsed it, not known as a Democratic organization with a capital D. <laughs> Look, and that's why the Wall Street Journal endorsed it as well. This is a truly bipartisan initiative. Joining our discussion now is Beto O'Rourke, former Democratic congressman from Texas who represented El Paso. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I, I find your lifetime experience uh, on the border invaluable, uh, an invaluable perspective in this discussion. Uh, what do you make of these, these dueling appearances, uh, President Biden going straight to uh, the Border Patrol, discussing with them uh, what's in the bill, asking them and other portions of that video that we haven't shown yet, asking them what they need. They tell him what they need. He then tells them, yes, that's in the bill. And uh, and then uh, Donald Trump just goes and does a show on Fox. The contrast could not be any more clear. President Biden is representing the party that is pro-immigration, pro-border security, and pro-solutions. Donald Trump, on the other hand, represents chaos. He's not interested in the solution because he's totally invested in the problem. And he's admitted as much. It is because of him that the deal that Senator Murphy and Lankford and Cinema negotiated was dead on arrival when it met the Senate, never even made it to the House. And he's proud of that fact. This is an extraordinary opportunity for the president to build on his accomplishments and to show that the way to restoring order, security, and safety at the border is to ensure that there are more legal pathways for immigrants and asylum seekers to come here. For example, when he used his executive parole authority for Nicaraguans and Haitians and Cubans, unauthorized crossings from those three groups went down 92 percent. He has shown that he can lead on this issue. And he's done everything in his power to try to work with Republicans today, even offering to work with former President Trump on this issue. It's time for Democrats and the president to seize this initiative on this issue and win with it. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> an analysis of uh, crime statistics from uh, that NBC News has done showing that overall crime levels dropping 
in the cities that have received the most migrants. When uh, Texas spends its money, as it spent a lot of it, uh, to transport migrants to these other cities, crime rate in New York City, for example, dropping, and other major cities uh, where, where this is happening, dropping. And so Donald Trump uh, spent much of his night uh, on the Fox show tonight uh, basically telling lies about the crime, uh, the crime wave that he's pretending occurs because of this. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, he would describe my hometown of El Paso as a war zone, a very dangerous place, when it was at the time one of, if not the safest cities in America. And it was one of the safest cities in America, not despite, but because it is a city of immigrants. But his hateful rhetoric, uh, describing this as an invasion, immigrants as an infestation or animals, putting them in cages, tearing babies away from the arms of their mothers, it inspired extraordinary violence that came home to us in El Paso in 2019, when someone echoing Trump's words, promising to stop the invasion of Hispanics who were taking over Texas, slaughtered 23 people in our very peaceful city in a Walmart on the Saturday before school started, full of kids and parents and grandparents. Now, Lawrence, he's talking about immigrants poisoning the blood of America, lifted right out of the pages of Mein Kampf or from the mouth of Adolf Hitler. This is our future with Donald Trump, and it's why we must stand up behind and with Joe Biden right now and make sure that he wins this election and that he has the push from us to ensure that he's the most pro-immigrant pro-border security and pro-solution president we've ever seen. Part of the reason we have the problem we do right now is administration after administration has kicked this can down the road. Joe Biden is trying to get a hold of this situation. We need to support him in doing that and draw this contrast so clearly between him and Donald Trump. Uh, pretty much for your whole life, this a version of this debate at different volumes has been going on in Washington about the southern border and, and issues at the southern border. It, it, for you and others who've, who've lived there, uh, is there something missing uh, from the debate that, that you all, uh, you know, when you're at the coffee shop, shake your heads about that they just don't get it? You know, I think we've been missing from the debate. Um, the folks who actually live on and experience the border day in and day out. You know, but thank God Joe Biden is visiting Brownsville, Texas right now. Thank God we have representatives like Veronica Escobar from El Paso, Texas, who has worked with her Republican colleagues to introduce comprehensive immigration reform. If the border were at the table, we wouldn't have what you're seeing today right now. You would have solutions like more legal pathways for people to come here and work some of these nine million unfilled jobs that we have in America, rejoining families who've been separated by the border and ensuring that people can come here to do better for themselves, but by extension to do better for all of us. Immigration is one of the greatest opportunities this country has. It's great for our economy. It's great for our communities. It's great for America. And I want our party to seize this initiative right now, because not only is it the right thing to do, I think that's the path to victory in November. Beto O'Rourke, thank you very much for your perspective on this tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. And coming up, is Clarence Thomas violating the law by not recusing himself in Donald Trump's immunity appeal to the United States Supreme Court? Senator Sheldon Whitehouse joins us next. As I indicated last night, I am not one who finds it outrageous that the Supreme Court has decided to hear Donald Trump's lawyer's argument about immunity, possibly applying to some of the charges against Donald Trump and Jack Smith's prosecution of Donald Trump for possible crimes leading up to and on January 6th. I am reserving my outrage for someday, possibly in May at the earliest, when we read the Supreme Court's opinion, which could be outrageous or could completely reject Donald Trump's claim of immunity, and then today's outrage will be forgotten. The Supreme Court has already rejected half of Donald Trump's petition to the Supreme Court, in which Trump lawyers argued a double jeopardy claim based on Donald Trump having faced an impeachment trial in the United States Senate on similar charges. Without comment, the Supreme Court simply threw that out, threw out the double jeopardy thing, threw it right out of the case yesterday when they announced they would hear argument only on the following question, whether 
And if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? Because the appeals court opinion in Washington, D.C. applies only to that federal jurisdiction, the Supreme Court may have reasonably decided that they should deliver an opinion on this question that will cover any crimes that could arise in all 50 states. The Supreme Court is the only court that can make the law of the land. All other courts only control specific sections of the country. There is one thing that I, for one, am ready to be outraged about right now and have been outraged about it since last night, and that is Clarence Thomas's refusal to recuse himself from the case. The law of the United States of America says any justice, judge, or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. He shall also disqualify himself in the following circumstances. He knows that he or his spouse has a financial interest in the subject matter in controversy or in a party to the proceeding or any other interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. Clarence Thomas's wife does indeed actually have a financial interest in the proceeding because Clarence Thomas's wife profited from the Trump presidency and would again. And Clarence Thomas's wife has an interest in a party to the proceeding. Donald Trump is a party to the proceeding. And Virginia Thomas has a desperate interest in Donald Trump, an interest in Donald Trump becoming president again. And she had a desperate interest in urging Donald Trump and White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows through text messages to commit the crimes they committed to try to overturn the presidential election. The outrage that is already upon us before the Supreme Court hears one word of argument in this case is the continuing ethical outrage that Clarence Thomas brings to the Supreme Court every day and is now right before the eyes of the Chief Justice and the rest of the members of the court ready to violate federal law that bars him from hearing this case. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. He's a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and he chairs the Subcommittee on Federal Courts. Senator Whitehouse, you are invited uh, to talk me down from my outrage uh, over the recusal issue. Can't do it. Okay. If, uh, if um, the Supreme Court were to decide that President Trump has presidential immunity, then Jack Smith's case would come to an end. And Jack Smith's case could very well, in producing evidence about the insurrection, produce evidence about Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny's role in that insurrection, including correspondence directly with the defendants, Trump's chief of staff. So there's a very direct conflict of interest. If he can help get rid of the case, he can protect his wife from the scrutiny of having her actions be evidence for the prosecution. So that's pretty blunt. I would say that there's an even worse outrage behind that which is that even now, we do not know what the facts are here. There is no other officer in the entire United States government who, when an ethics question is raised, doesn't have the facts about what took place found by some independent entity. It is only these nine justices who have reserved for themselves the right to say, here's what I say the facts are, and nobody else gets another view. And Justice Thomas has simply refused to disclose what he knew and when he knew it about his wife's insurrection activities. And that has tainted a number of Supreme Court cases already. So it's a double trouble problem, an immediate conflict in this case, and a signal of this larger problem of the court not pl playing by the rules of rule of law. So the, what I just read is a law. It's it's not it's, some, it's not some rule that someone created. No, it's that, not some court rule. So, it's not some judicial principle. It's the law of the land of the United States of America. And how is that law enforced? Well, by courts. And of course, at this point, you've got a court that doesn't want to 
have that law enforced on himself. And the very basic sort of opening bid of any law enforcement effort of any contest of law is that you find out what the facts are. Fact finding is elemental to a decision to go forward on an ethics matter, on a recusal matter, in a civil case, in a criminal case. It's across the board. So it's extremely peculiar that this Supreme Court will not allow fact finding as to its own ethics problems. So uh, we know that in the last hour, uh, Virginia Thomas was watching her hero on Fox talk about this very case that her husband is considering, uh, maybe with her husband sitting beside her. Let's listen to what uh, Clarence Thomas's wife was listening to uh, and Donald Trump arguing his own case on Fox in the last hour. They have to do the immunity thing, because if you don't, a president will not be able to be a president. If you're going to make a big decision as president and you're afraid that as soon as you get out, you're going to be indicted by the opposition party, by the Democrats, by the radical left lunatics who will indict you and try and put you in prison because you're trying to do something good for the country, even if it's severe, the severe may be a great thing for the country. They have to have presidential immunity. If you don't have immunity for a president, and I'm not talking about only me, if you don't have immunity for a president, you're going to, you will not be able to function properly. Uh, and so, uh, I don't know, does, does Mrs. Thomas uh, turn to her favorite Supreme Court justice and say, what do you think after that? Well, I, she has a term that she refers to her husband with. I, I think my best friend is the way they often describe each other. And she actually talks about talking with her best friend in the communications that went back and forth between her and the defendant, Trump's uh, chief of staff. So you could actually even go beyond just having Ginny Thomas figure in the evidence in the case presuming that Clarence Thomas is the best friend that she mentions, he could actually appear in the case. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And just by the way, the president's commentary is complete nonsense. We've had, you know, a lot of United States presidents. Uh, they have never been charged criminally. The one who came closest was President Nixon. He did not concede that the criminal law did not apply to him. He conceded that it did apply to him. Throughout the entire history of the United States of America, there's never been a problem of a president not being able to do something lawful that he should be doing for the people of the United States because of fear of criminal prosecution. This is an imaginary uh, figment of Donald Trump's. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And coming up, Vladimir Putin is trying to obstruct tomorrow's funeral of Alexei Navalny, who was assassinated by Vladimir Putin. Alexei Navalny's friend, Nadia Tolokonikova, co-founder of Pussy Riot, joins us next. Today, the European Parliament adopted a resolution condemning the murder of Alexei Navalny and calling for Vladimir Putin to be held accountable for that murder. The resolution says the Russian government and Vladimir Putin personally bear criminal and political responsibility for the death of their most prominent opponent, Alexei Navalny. The lawmakers also called for an independent and transparent international investigation into the circumstances of Alexei Navalny's death. Alexei Navalny's funeral will be held in Moscow tomorrow, but Vladimir Putin's government is trying to stop it. At first, we were not allowed to rent a funeral hall to say goodbye to Alexei. Now, when just a funeral service is supposed to take place in the church, ritual, ritual agents tell us that not a single hearse agrees to take the body there. Unknown people call all teams and threaten them not to take Alexei's body anywhere. That was from a Navalny family spokesperson. Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia, says... She is worried Vladimir Putin's police will show up and arrest people at the funeral. The Associated Press reported last week over 300 people were detained in Russia while paying tribute to opposition leader Alexei Navalny. In an op-ed piece in The New York Times, our next guest, Nadia Tolokonikova, wrote about the first time she saw Alexei Navalny at a protest in Russia in 2007 when she was 16 years old. 
For the next 17 years, I watched my friend Alexei rise from a Moscow blogger to a global moral and political figure, giving hope and inspiration to people around the world. He helped me and millions of Russians realize that our country doesn't have to belong to KGB agents and the Kremlin's henchmen. He gave us something else, too, a vision he called the beautiful Russia of the future. This vision is immortal, unlike us humans, President Vladimir Putin may have silenced Alexei, who died last week, but no matter how hard he tries, Mr. Putin won't be able to kill Alexei's beautiful dream. Years later, after Nadia co-founded Pussy Riot, she was arrested for singing a protest song in a church. She writes, Months later, when my Pussy Riot colleagues and I were on trial for supposedly inciting religious hatred there, standing in the courtroom among our family members and activists, was Alexei. Nadia was convicted in that trial and sentenced to prison. She wrote, How is life in prison? Alexei asked me on the phone in 2013. Not ideal, but not too bad, I answered. One can survive here. Alexei's team later told me that he recalled our conversation when he decided to go back to Russia after his poisoning in 2020. It was a characteristically brave decision. From his return to his death, it was just three years. Joining us now is Nadia Tolokonikova, a longtime friend of Alexei Navalny and co-founding member of the Russian protest art collective Pussy Riot. Nadia, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I know this is difficult for you, and I just want to begin by saying I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you, Lawrence. When you uh, write about uh, your friend Alexei in The New York Times, uh, we learn much about him and much about you, and, and it's the story of two very brave people, but the way you write it, I, I know uh, that you see only one brave person in that story. Uh, you see Alexei Navalny as uniquely brave among Russian protest leaders. Um, Alexei Navalny led with love and joy. I think, aside from bravery, this this is a um, really important characteristic of him. Um, he was able to install this vision of the beautiful Russia of the future, not just with words, but with actions and with his love to his country. And he was willing to sacrifice everything, including his own life for this country. And we witnessed one of the most beautiful modern love stories of Alexei Navalny and his wife, Yulia. And it's heartbreaking that Putin murdered not just Alexei, but also this beautiful love story. You mentioned uh, something about Vladimir Putin here that as soon as I read it, it made perfect sense about part of his motivation uh, in relation to Alexei Navalny. You say, uh, people say Mr. Putin feared Alexei, but I think the reason he wanted to get rid of Alexei was another emotion, a darker, more sinister one. It was envy. Uh, as soon as I read that, it, it made perfect sense. Dictators know they are not really admired. They know that what they have is fear. They don't have envy. Uh, but your observation of that is so powerful in, in there, and, and, it, and it just seems so clear when you put it that way. Alexei is everything Putin is not. He's handsome, loved, tall. <laughs> He's actually followed by people because they trust him and they um, they want to be the, they want to be his friend. Who on earth would want to be Putin's friend? <laughs> Can you, uh, I know for Americans who aren't faced with this kind of uh, life or death choice about how they uh, ex express themselves politically in this country, uh, can you explain to people why Alexei Navalny would go back to Russia knowing that this was something Vladimir Putin would want to do, that when he goes back to Russia, it is very likely Vladimir Putin will at minimum get him in prison and kill him. Alexei saw himself as a Russian politician. He never wanted to leave country. I never wanted to leave my country. 
I saw myself and see myself as a Russian artist. We need to be on our land. And especially if you're a politician, you ask people to risk a lot. In a dictatorship, you ask them to leave their houses, go to streets, probably get bitten, probably thrown to jail. And you cannot morally do that if you speak from abroad. Alexei knew it and he was willing to risk. He also knew that he, is, um, he has fantastic support in Russia. And I don't think people here see um, the scale of the support because we don't really have real media and also real polls in Russia. But I lived in Russia until recently. And um, when you go to shop, when you talk to taxi driver, a random person, if you bring up the name of Navalny, chances are they will say that if we would have actual elections, I would support him. And Vladimir Putin knew it. Uh, you, you write in your piece, we owe it to Alexei and his dream for a new, beautiful Russia to carry on the fight. Uh, it, it sounds like he will continue to be powerful even in death. He will, and we see we see it with uh, all um, all the rituals that the Russian government does around Alexei Navalny's body. They are scared of him, even when he's dead, and it shows how powerful this figure is. And it is a very biblical story. It is funny that I was the one who was uh, accused of religious hatred, thrown in jail labor camps for two years. But I think, in fact, people who hurt religious feelings more than anyone is Putin, his bureaucrats, and um, Russian patriarch, uh, patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, they do not let Navalny's relatives and people who loved him to say goodbye to Alexei uh, with dignity. Nadia Tolokonikova, again, I'm very sorry for your loss, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. We'll be right back. Nadia Tolokonikova gets tonight's last word.